Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. Hello, people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always great to have you with us. And I'm joined by everyone today, which is fantastic. Dale, how are you, sir? I'm not too bad. Thank you, Val. It's warming up nicely in the UK. I think we're hitting the consistent oh, 20s. I, I know. I know. Oh, I didn't. It's, uh, it's getting ordinary out there. I can tell you it's getting very cold and we've got a lot of rain happening. So a lot of floods in the east coast of Australia at the moment. Um, but yeah. the great thing is a lot of our old colleagues from Transport for London, 4LM are moving down to Australia. And I'll tell you about that a bit later. Nice. Martin, how are you, sir? Yeah, very good, thanks. And yourself? Not too bad. I'm sore, mate. I'm sore. I'll tell you about <laughs> that too. We were just talking about that before, but uh, it's uh, no, I'm well. I'm well. I'm glad to see you are here. You missed a great episode. Last I did. I'm halfway Dave. through it. I'm yeah, downloaded it. <laughs> very good. <laughs> uh, good, mate. Well, welcome back. And look, let's welcome our special guest today. First time on the podcast, Miss Baha Maksudi. How are you? Good. Thank you. Very well. Very well. Glad to be here with you guys. Yeah, and glad to have you. And I think Dale's been trying to get you, he said, since we started the podcast. So uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, now, I know before we get into the, the nitty gritty of governance, uh, you wanted to say something special. So I'll hand over the mic to you. Uh, someone special that you wanted to talk about? Yes. Um, actually, uh, it's uh, um, Deborah James. Um, and she's been recently in the news. Um, she has um, bowel cancer, and um, she—I uh, didn't know anything about her, but uh, I found out about her um, because uh, you know she has um, done fantastic work for uh, uh, cancer, bowel cancer, in terms of awareness, uh, in, in terms of giving lots of hope to a lot of people with similar cancer. Um, really, I didn't realize that she's been very inspirational and, um, you know, in a way of she dealt with her own illness and how she has inspired others um, in terms of coping with this terrible disease. Um, and uh, for the past, I think, uh, couple of days, she has managed to raise over four million pounds, which is fantastic. Oh. And I think, you know, it's, it's mm. great, you know, it just shows that uh, one person can have such an impact, um, such a huge impact in terms of the stigmatizing um, what the bowel cancer is about and how people need to be aware of what to look for, the signs, and um, very educational, very inspirational. And I just um, been really in awe and I um, wanted to sort of mention her. Um, I believe um, her cancer is terminal and, um, you know, she's with her family and loved ones. And um, just thought to uh, bring that up and uh, talk about her a bit and, you know, just realize how uh, lucky I am and we are that, you know, we're healthy and, um, you know, we carry on in our lives. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just wanted to mention her, I uh, really. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks, Baha. I really, uh, well, being Australian, I haven't heard too much about it. And, you know, I'm not allowed to watch the news anymore because it's too scary. But look, shout out to Deborah James and, and everyone who is, you know, suffering in their plight. Um, I know some people close to me that are also um, battling with cancer and, and various other health forms. So look after yourselves, people projects can get tough i know we do focus on them but they aren't the most important thing in your life and uh, get some perspective and get those checkups while you're at it um i'm talking to myself actually i haven't had a checkup in a few years i should probably do that right um but look switching gears and and on a lighter note uh baha i guess governance in perspective of cancer is a little bit more um easier to digest uh i wanted to talk to you about how uh what maybe let's start with what governance is to you uh, as a definition, and then from there, we can unbreak or, or decompose what you think uh, is good about it and what is not good about it. 
So really, is a uh, corporate governance uh, is something that um, uh, every uh, corporation has in place as a safeguard um, in terms of how you um, deliver a project, how you conduct yourself uh, as a company. And so um, there are certain rules and certain um, way of working and consideration um, when you are delivering a project or you are conducting yourself in a uh, public domain. Um, and so sometimes, um, you know, it's more stringent and sometimes it's very, very um, light touch. Um, so mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, for, for us, where I am in Transport for London is uh, quite uh, relied on. It's quite a big part of uh, the corporation in terms of how um, we do every single thing, uh, absolutely everything um, from, you know, when you set up the business cases, how you go about uh, getting the project done, how you spend the money on the project, how you plan it, how you resource it. It, it really um, pretty much in all aspects um, mm -hmm. of what we do. So that's, that is the governance and really it's uh, having, a, um, you know, everything we do is we need to be quite uh, conscious of how we do it and how we might affect, um, you know, people or individuals or companies or unions and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, fantastic. And I think as well, while we're getting definitions and a bit, bit, bit more information about yourself, uh, we would love to know how you got into uh, projects. Where did it start for you, Baha? Because we love these uh, origin stories. I know Dale <laughs> is smiling there, but where did, it, where did it start for you? So I, oh God, I sound ancient. <laughs> 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 In fact, I was talking to somebody recently who I'm going to go and look after their project. And I, I, I sort of mentioned that I uh, graduated in 1992 from civil engineering. And he started calculating in his head, said, oh my God, I was only six years old. You know, I'm like, oh God. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I finished engineering and I just started working as an engineer. And then uh, gradually I kind of came through the ranks and, um, I didn't really, I wasn't in rail. I, I started in a startup, telecoms, a startup company, in, you know, and I moved here from Canada. And then um, during the dot-com era, um, the company struggled to stay afloat and then they basically shut the business in, in the UK. Then from there, I went to EDF Energy um, and I worked. Um, as a managing the construction delivery of the fiber optics in their spare network in London um, because they have the route into the buildings. And so we were competing with the cold network and, um, you know, it was, a, it was quite um, innovative. But then again, uh, EDF was also a regulated entity. We were working in a non-regulated section of the business and they were quite risk adverse and there's something that they, they start getting worried about you know you mm -hmm. you have a lot of big corporation on your system and then if, what if something happened you know and so at that time um trans4m started which became metronet and um edf had a stake into ppp and then i really wanted to come to rail because rail was the thing to do and uh, I went and, um, you know, I really had a hard time get, getting on, a, on the rail project, you know. And um, uh, there was a, a, a seaboard contracting, which was becoming part of uh, EDF Energy. And they, they did put me on Channel Tunnel Rail Link. I went there to help with the project there. They were installing substation along the route uh, for the high speed one. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, basically, um, I um, they they contacted me and they said, uh, "Do you want to interview the managing director of Seaboard?" And most of the guys, you know, it was really hard to get to transfer. I'm like, "Oh, that's a really good opportunity. I take my CV with me." And while I'm interviewing him, you know, 
maybe I slip him my CV. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was really good. I met him and it's hard. We're really having a hard time getting people um, to go on uh, Metro and I transform. I was, oh, really? I said, oh, I really want to go. I haven't managed. And I give him my CV and you would not believe it. In two days time, I was sitting on a dad near, you know, in transform for uh, m in glass house, you know. So um, yeah, then the rest is history. As they say. So I end up being in rail since then. Um, and I've learned a lot, you know, I mean, and I started managing project. I was a pre-construction, uh, a pre-contract um, manager there. Uh, I was dealing with Atkins, uh, the designers. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I left after a year when I sat in a meeting with 19 people talking about tiling or over tiling. You know, and I'm thinking, this is crazy. You know, it's uh, we have all these damages racking up on a daily basis and we're sitting here contemplating which way to go, you know, it was, and I remember Old Gate East was the station. I was like, oh my God, you know. So I left and I uh, joined Balfour BT. I became head of maintenance over there. I had 75 uh, men work at night and we have lots of engineers. It was really rewarding. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was really hard. I must say it was not easy. Uh, Bobby did really well. And uh, yeah, and then I'm, I mean, just carried on. You know, I went from one thing to another, you know, very strange. I went to East London Line, did some work on East London Line. Um, and then, um, you know, I worked for Vinci, uh, Taylor Woodrow, that is. Um, did a lot of work on Tottenham Court Road Station upgrade, gone to the depot. So yeah, lots of different things, but really on rail. And then I um, I want a bit of work-life balance. You know, I was doing really long hours. You know, you don't realize that when you're younger and just ambitious, you want to do more, you want to learn. So you keep working, working, you know. And then I thought, no, mm. just, you know, 12, 15 hour day. You know. Then so I um, decided to join TFM. And uh, I joined them in 2015, and I've been there since. Um, and it's been good, you know, they have a lot of good and not so good, some not so great. Um, but they give me what I was looking for at the time, which gave me more time with my family and a bit more of a sanity. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an interesting journey. And then... Um, I went on Central Line Improvement Program where I met Dale, uh, which is great. You know, we had a lot of talk about things. And then I, um, um, I was on Elizabeth Line and uh, Crossrail. They asked me to go to do the street station, which I'm really, really grateful that I went there. And um, yeah, and I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm finishing there, actually coming back to TFL uh, very soon. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing. I think the great thing about that Baja is now it's immortalized in this podcast and, uh, and future generations will be able to learn from your experiences and where you come from. And I think that's great uh, to leave a legacy and pay it forward. As we say, Dale, uh, I had a question just to maybe one to get your agreement on whether you've agreed with it and where you think, uh, governance is maybe stifling or slowing projects or affecting projects. The standard definition Baja is project governance is the framework for how project decisions are made. It tells you that activities from the organization and what they do and who's responsible. Project governance therefore covers all these aspects around policy, governance, regulations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree with that statement? And where do you think governance goes too far? I think when you, when it uh, takes over, you know, in a sense, when I say take over, when you are not able to make a decision um, on your project as a team that you see is best for the project to get it to where it needs to be. And that's when the interference of uh, the governance is the problem. You know, we, um, there has been many times, number of times, you know, you look at something, um, and you look at the project, you say, okay, um, we need to make these decisions to 
meet the deadline, do the time. But it's like, well, no, you haven't gone through these gates. You haven't um, get a signature of uh, 25 people. You know, where is your signature? Where is the acceptance of the engineering planning? Oh my God, you know, the number of, you know, signatures and acceptance. And by the time you get all of these things in place, the time gone. You know, time, time doesn't stand for anyone. And so, you know, and forever, instead of doing something value, you know, add value, value added, uh, which to me is productivity. You know, um, I think it, it's just this crossroad where, you know, you got to get on and do some of these things and then you're forever in the land of paperwork. Yeah, that's that's where I find it very frustrating, and um, you know, and it seemed that nobody seemed to want to. A lot of people know it, but nobody seemed to want to do anything about it. Um, so yeah, that that's where uh, frustration comes. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I'm alone in that. You know, I I I think. Um, what happened is because of a lot of really good people leave, you know, a lot of good people, a lot of innovative thinkers, people who can make a difference, which we need, they just give up and get frustrated and they just go. So yeah, that, that's, that's to me, you know, it doesn't really um, jive. And I think some people use governance to justify their existence. You know, to have so many meetings, meeting about a meeting, to just to say, well, actually, I've done my job for, you know, I've done my, my thing, you know. Um, so I think if it doesn't add value, it shouldn't be there. I love the way you put that. If it doesn't add value, it shouldn't be there. And Baha, I have been in some of those meetings with you where you've been frustrated and those listening to you for the first time might mistake you for being soft-spoken and, you know, but I've seen the feisty <laughs> side of you as well. I just wonder, you, 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 <laughs> you sort of danced around a little bit, you know, some of the things that don't add value. Could you share some examples of what you've encountered with governance stifling innovation, just to share with the audience out there so they, that they might go, ah, oh, that happens to me too. And then maybe we can explore ways and how we break down those barriers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, for example, um, you know, um, I remember I was in Liverpool Street Station delivering, uh, you know, we were delivering, and we were in the middle of transformation, God knows what. And, um, you know, we, uh, we were told, uh, you know, so I carry on as planned, you know, I just, started working you know doing the, the groundwork doing this and that and then uh, i got a visit um i shall remain nameless and i said uh, oh my god you've done all of this work have you got um have you gone through the gate have you got all the signature for all the works and i think one piece of work which we did i didn't have any signature on that piece of paper <laughs> And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, you're in a breach. You're in a breach of this uh, requirement. And I'm like, okay, what's going what's gonna to happen? What, what does that do? It's like, oh, you didn't get uh, authority to spend. I, I'm not joking. We're talking, you know, 10 million, 20 million project. And you're talking about 2,000 pounds worth, worth of uh, item that I haven't had got the uh, signature for. So they stopped the project. What? They stopped, now, if you imagine, they stopped the project until I get that signature. And in fact, I was told that, you know, they let me get over it this time, but next time will be basically consequences to be paid. <laughs> it's a disciplinable action. And in fact, I could lose my job. And um, so I just couldn't believe it. I, actually, I was quite scared. I just thought, what, 2,000 pounds, you know? I was like, no, 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 governance bar, you know? You got to get the, go you got to get the signature of everyone. You can't just go spend public money. And I'm thinking, so you're stopping me for a week, 
for me to get signatures. So I'm have all these men standing. You have project team paid for, and you're talking about two th how much that's costing, how much that will cost. You know, and I think that was a bit of a wake up call for me. And I think uh, Central Line Improvement Program was also very similar in that, you know, everything was, uh, you know, you had to justify, you had to, I mean, I was approving POs when I moved to Crossrail. I never forget it, for two pounds, you know, I was approving a PO for two pounds. Like how much has it cost for that PO to get to me? Forget about me signing. So that's what I'm saying. You know, it's like, well, what value is the signature add? You what know? can you buy for two pounds these days? Not much. Can't I think get there was some anymore. sort of connector. It was a connector for the cable. You know, it was an electrical install in the cab. You know, I, I couldn't can... believe it. I was showing my, my colleagues uh, when I was there in the... Uh, in Crossrail, like, look what I'm signing for. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's maybe sound very controversial, but um, and then you always worried. So, what happened to me when this happened? I always worried about, oh, okay, am I, am I within the confines of governance? Am I not doing something? Maybe I'm not doing. Am I good? Or so I stopped really being who I was and what I was about, meaning, you know, pushing the project, looking at different way of doing things. Um, That's interesting. So, so, so governance actually governed you as a person and your character in the end. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's stifling within itself. I just wonder by the same token though, that if governance is so much, so out there and there's a, a strict system, does that also then, I guess, allow people to play the system rather than to deliver, to deliver projects? Oh, for sure, because you can use it to your advantage in a sense of, you know, you become sort of a gatekeeper of these things and you can actually, you know, leverage your power on things. You know, that's normal human being, you know, normal being mm. human in this way that, you use your power for sometimes your own gain. Uh, yeah, of course. And does a personality come to it? Is it like, oh, I don't like this person, so I'm going to make their life much harder. <laughs> 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 just, I know to... I like that person, but, you know, let them get away with it. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just to come back to it as well, you know, if let's say, TFL's got what, over 40,000 people. If 40,000 people each were spending two grand not getting signed off, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate on the other side with public money. Mm. Is, is that enough to have that governance in? I don't know. And, and perhaps there's you no know, delegation of authorities that we need to start talking about as well. Is that at the right level? I don't, it, it's quite a complex piece actually, governance to get right. Is there a right level of governance and how do we know when it's the right level i think you know when um, i don't know if you guys know about that uh, signaling fiasco so it's the it should not be a hypocrite hypocrisy right so governance should apply uh, equally right so if you remember, I don't know if you remember the signaling contract, which cost 900 million pounds and Bombardier basically pulled out of the uh, contract. I don't know if you remember, it's actually public knowledge. It's a, it's a London Assembly report on this. So my question is, so where did that go, that 900 million pounds wasted? So we're talking about 2,000 pounds, you know, how many 2,000 pounds is that? You know, why is there no discussion around where was the governance for that? You know, where yeah. was the accountability for that? I think you have to give some, um, well, you have to have confidence in the ability of your project managers that they are able to make decisions for certain things. And in fact, the decision they're making um, 
is good enough for the organization, you have to have some trust, you know, in, in their ability. In my experience, and from, you know, the bigger picture. So, yeah, I agree with you if everybody, but, you know, then you look at across the piece and you think, well, how did, how did that happen? You know, how, how does these things happen? Overspending, you know, by not, you know, two grand or, you know, we're talking millions, you know? Mm. Then we talk about, you know, it's a bit of hypocrisy. It's like, well, actually, you know, you can't apply it when it suits and kind of look away when it suits. So, um, but I think it's just um, governance has to be fit for purpose. It has to work for the project. You're right, we're spending public money so we should spend it right. We should spend it and give something back. That's what I think. You know, I used to use this analogy. I said, do you think if I go stand by the gate line and everybody travel and say, actually, I, I'm going to spend 250,000 pounds of your money, you know, doing X. How would you feel about it? You know, how you feel me sitting, just not getting on and doing the work? They're not going to be happy with that. I wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> That's but very, think, very true. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I think this, the company has to, you know, believe and trust these people to an extent, you, you know. It's very important because they then they do more for you. They, they, uh, they, they understand that. Yeah, and you, you, so, you touch yeah. on a, a very important topic or, or word there, uh, trust, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting one because trust has many different layers to, I guess, to achieving it. One is, I guess, on a personal level, but then in terms of trusting someone and giving them the authority to crack on with, you know, millions and in some cases billions of pounds, it, it, it's quite a it's quite a tall ask, I think. Um, and so I can see where you definitely need the layers of governance, but the other aspect of trust is also capability and experience, which you touched on. And one thing we know for sure is that at the moment, there's a shortage, just there's, there's not enough supply of, you know, suitably qualified and experienced personnel. And so in that, that within itself probably leads us to go, well, can I trust that that person makes the right decisions because they don't have the relevant experience now? And so, and, and so those layers are almost a necessary evil at times. I'm just not trying to play devil's advocate to it. Um, and so, so yeah, so it's, it's an interesting one to ponder because I don't think any of us on this call actually know what the right level of governance is. And it is, a, it is one of those where it, it does depend, right? Um, so... I'm not sure where I'm going with this, to be honest. Um, but if, if, if we take governance from a controls perspective, because that's probably the sweet spot, right? My default. I think, particularly when we work together, Baha, the, we found a level of governance that, that made common sense, I think. And, mm -hmm. and the application mm -hmm. of the governance was almost more important than the governance itself. And so as a first line of assurance, as controls, project controls, you, you need to be able to provide both the assurance, but also on the flip side, the, you know, two sides of the same coin, be adding value to delivery. Because if all you're doing is just governing and maybe reporting a little bit, then you're not actually really fulfilling your job, in my opinion, from mm -hmm. a controls governance perspective. And so I wonder if you have any comments on that for, I guess, project managers coming into the profession, um, mm -hmm. controllers, planners, risk folk coming into mm -hmm. the profession from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know how I feel about planning program. Oh, my God. You know, it's like two Bibles in, in any project manager's life, at least for me, was always contract program. Yeah, how am I doing? You know, where am I? If because it's really, that's the driver. And I had a, you know, a 
project director, you know, um, he always said to me, if you follow the program and stick to the program, everything falls into place, you know, and it, it's so true in that. So, yes, I think We've lost audio there. Baha, uh -huh. we've lost your audio. Yeah, we have lost your audio. Something that well, somebody... Well, you're back, you're back with okay. us. Yeah, what about this? <laughs> oh, you lost me. Uh-huh. So, now I'm saying that the, you need the, you need project control. You need, uh, you know, you need uh, have those check and balance. You need people around you to kind of also kind of tell you, okay, hang on, hang on a minute, or what about this? You need that. It's a conscious, you know, they need to be your conscious. And my planner needs to challenge me, you know, he should challenge. Well, why are you doing it this way? Why don't you do it that way? Have you thought about this? What about that? That's what you want. You do need people like that around you. You need your commercial man say, oh, hang on a minute, Bob that decision you're making, you know, do you know these consequences? Those are the, you know, you need that. I'm not saying that. To me, that is more along the line of coming together, put your arms around your project manager, put your arms around the project to, you know, have those check and balance and make sure you are in the right path, you know, because as a person, one person, you're not gonna see the full picture. That's why project has all facets, planners, risk, controls. These are all absolute necessary, you know, but the extent of it is what I'm saying and how much you have to report upward, how much, you know, I mean, that's what I'm thinking, you know, it's very important. And number one for a project manager is a very good planner, a planner who can build a project in his head. I can tell you what you need to know and the project control. That that is absolute. I'm not just saying that because Dale, you're asking. You know how I feel about that. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to poke the bear a little bit, Baha. Mm. But um, <laughs> talk talking of talking of uh, you know someone challenging you. We've got Machine Gun Martin with us here. Um, and Martin's remit really with Machine Gun Martin persona is to really try and poke the bear. So I'm going to hand over to him to see if he can uh, rile some, a few emotions up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think you, you've, you're already on a roll with your uh, thoughts on confidence there. Um, so you, you've kind of started talking about how, how we can fix it, how, how people can actually add value. In your experience, is there certain aspects of government that are just non-negotiable? We need to do it maybe things like safety and other aspects that we should just almost get rid of because ultimately governance is about stopping the cowboys and delivering value for money. That's why it's probably there in, in the big companies, but in the big government organizations, but are there some things that you just get rid of and some things that you absolutely need to happen? I think you need all of it, but extend of it, you know, it, it, they all have merits, you know, I'm not really advocating to get rid of completely or get rid of each. I think, if, you know, you have to, first of all, apply it at the right time, at the right amount, you know, and um, how much do you apply when you apply. Um, the thing is, I think you need to have people who come from the project delivery operations as part of people who set these governance because the experience has to come into those uh, decision making, you know. Um, so no, I'm not a big, ad, you know, I work for an organization that had very light touch governance and they, it doesn't work because you, you're lost, you feel lost because you need system you know it's like it's like when you have kids you know if they don't have boundary they keep pushing you until you give them a boundary you know so uh, to give them some steer um no it, it's good but i think um maybe the emphasis you see because if you're a client then you if you don't you shouldn't deliver as such you should leave it to the delivery organization to deliver 
Now, if you don't know where you sit, if you're a client org delivery organization, you're sort of in half halfway house because you want to deliver because it's exciting and sexy, but also you want to be a client, then you have to think about, okay, is it, you know, does this work? Does all these straight jacket they put on you, does it actually uh, <laughs> help you to get to the point you want to be? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to demonstrate that you have, you've been responsible. Yeah, you have, you have, you've been responsible. You have parted with your duties the best you can. And, uh, you know, that, that is ultimate. And, and Dale is right, is experience is very important. Uh, have, uh, having knowledge, um, you know, that and how you actually made your way uh, to, to where you are. I think a lot of people think, you know, if you parachute to a senior role, um, oh, it's brilliant, but it's not because you don't have a solid footing, you know solid foundation to try to challenge you got to be able to challenge uh, you know you've got to be able to ask the right questions and um, you need that so no I think it's just need an overhaul you know I think governance needs an overhaul it needs to become more pragmatic we, we've moved away we're in the digital world uh, tech, tech is a big part now I remember Dale came and brought our Power BI, you know, big pusher of, and things have changed, you know, we have moved um, beyond, you know, we have to progress. Uh, so, yeah, that's my view anyway. I don't know, maybe a lot of people disagree. Mm. <laughs> that's good, just, just one more. So, so we've got, so in one of the biggest news stories in the UK in the last week is about the, the Crossrail project. The Elizabeth Line's finally going to come yeah. into service um, in a couple of weeks' time. 41 months after the original date, how did you find the... Was there a failing of governance there? <laughs> did it get in the way of innovation? No, you know... Do you have um, any choice words for, my, around you this? You know, my... Can I say... Um, the one thing I have to say, unless people actually deliver on Crossrail, they don't really understand in my view the complexity of this piece of work Absolutely. one thing is when you think about when people decided to build this network ooh, i don't know 12 14 15 years ago on a piece of paper they came about the design and they decided to do something that that was then to make that functional operational safe right um, and they were very, very ambitious, you know, very ambitious, like, like um, what they put against. And when I joined and I saw what we were trying to achieve and the enormity and the complexity of what we were going to achieve, it really completely blew my mind. It took me two weeks just to understand the system, just, just understanding you know, have a bit of understanding. So I think, um, I think uh, very, they were very optimistic with something so complicated that I, I, I've never, I've been in this business over 20 years. I've never seen anything like it. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> my cat. <laughs> he wants to know about governance. Sorry, I better give it on my cat. Anyway, so I think, I think, you know, when I was sitting outside, looking inside, I was asked the same question as you would do. But when I actually went in and I saw what it was about, I was astonished. And remember, we haven't built a proper standalone railway in, in London for, since Victoria Line. Everything's been extension of the existing line. This is a brand new railway where you have to get licensed. You got to demonstrate you're safe to operate. This is not a Northern Line extension or this is a, you know, large. Now, I'm not saying mistake was not, you know, been there. I'm not saying they couldn't have done better. For sure, we all can. Um, but I think, um, actually, I, I read a lot of, 
books on railway, if you go through Victorian times, every single railway since have been about 20% above what they originally estimate. So I don't think this is unusual. Now, which brings me to this whole idea of less and learn. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely born. The less and learn where everybody talks, oh, well, actually, we're all going to learn a lesson, you know, less and learn this, less and learn that. I'm like, oh, yeah. But lesson only learned by people. Now, people take their lesson with you. There's no some system somewhere in ether where you dump everything you, you know. In fact, Crossrail did have one. I was yeah. in Crossrail a long time ago. You know, everybody got to get, what did we learn? We put it there. Now you ask, where is that? Who's going to use it? Do you think HS2 has, you know, access to that system? No. If the people who've been on this project goes to those projects, they take the lesson and they hopefully apply it uh, to these projects. So, uh, so yeah, I think, um, you know, Crossrail had governance, you know, it has all of these things in place, but, you know, it's, it's just what they had decided to build and um, so many years ago and what it turned out to be. But it's something I'm so proud of to be part of. I, I've, you know, I've worked with fantastic people and they know, I don't just say these things. I work with my team were brilliant. I honestly, very hard working. Was the, me um, was the message on Crossrail? Cause obviously it's got, with the the majority of the UK public who who don't see the, the the detail like like yourself, there was a lot of delays that were announced a few days before it was meant to to come out, or you know some quite big you know the overspend values are in the hundreds of millions within six months of the last report. It, think things like that. W was the governance maybe a failure of not communicating the the real progress with the government stakeholders or? you know, because you, you'll have had a far better picture on the ground and you were doing some magnificent work. Um, no, I think, the, I think there how was could we a, learn? I th well, I think there was a um, uh, over optimistic view and disconnect. You know, I, I definitely, I've seen, I was, I seen it when I was there. So I was there about nine years ago. Then I left and I went back again. I'm there now. I've been there two years. And there was definitely a bit of disconnect and also um, joint venture arrangements is a question mark for me, you know, because you bring companies that have totally different um, culture, ideology, approach, you put them together and you tell them, you know, work as one and apply your, uh, your system as one and it doesn't necessarily uh, works, you know, it, it just doesn't and it hasn't. So I guess one of the things is, you know, when you say joint venture, actually, are you introducing more risk and, you know, having that kind of setup? Um, and I would say that um, being transparent and open about uh, what is going on and what's happening uh, is mm. very, very important, I think. I remember when I was in Whitechapel, and uh, we were working, we had a really good team on site, working very hard. We had people who actually had the whole image of Whitechapel a station in the head, you know, about the piling where they pile. It, it was really good. But I think what happened was we were looking and thinking, how are they going to finish, you know? And we were thinking, and maybe, maybe they're going to, you know, not build this, leave the shaft, leave the shaft, and use the shaft as access, and then run the train through you know this is 10 years ago nine uh, we were thinking no it's not gonna happen how is it gonna happen you know so um i think listening is very important listening to your people on site you know having that presence coming and saying okay how's it going what's happening what do you need um understanding uh, what's going on you know it's it's so important i find and having a good um you know good structure in place um you know in terms of how you collaborate how the client works with you 
and being open, you know, if everybody knew when where I was that it's not gonna happen. So how can we know, but nobody else knew, you know, I mean, really, you know, you see all the hoardings everywhere. How is that possible? Mm. So yeah, I think, I think that that is for me, uh, it's very important. I've just been listening Baha, while you and uh, the rest of the team here have been having some conversations and it's interesting to observe. And I guess when you're listening properly, uh, as, as Dave Snowden says, uh, quiet listening is that what he said <laughs> instead silent, of actively silent, listening? silent silent listening, listening. i love yeah. that it was great uh you mentioned structure and and so it's akin to a framework in sorts and i think some of the language you're using around visibility uh is interesting and transparency and then we have obviously cost with uh, government projects which are largely funded by taxpayers and the misappropriation of those funds uh, and again back to the definition at the start of this podcast was around I guess the enabling or governance being an enabler by allowing us to make informed decisions. And I think what we're saying now is it, there is probably a place for governance, uh, but it's applying the right level of governance. And so for, from my perspective, I think some of the things that you're mentioning uh, kind of fall into the, I think they'll made a, a simulation as well that around project controls and how we could have more relevant, more value adding uh, governance structures because again it it really is up to the people but i always found that governance was uh, a reinforcement factor of a good process so most processes flow from left to right yeah we want to get this information from here to there what's the most efficient way to do that uh, if you think of a linear project most projects are the same and therefore the things that i need to really clarify importance on i need some form of governance around and that's always around safety. Usually it's around equality. Um, and then if you can reinforce those factors, everything else should really just be uh, a swim lane and, and have some transactional artifacts associated. But I think what happens in government in particular, because we've all got experience with government, you get multiple layers of it because it is politically driven. Um, and I'm not necessarily convinced, and someone can out there can convince me, that government is 100% behind performance, efficiency, and effectiveness. I think there is a large ploy not to be as motivated as we are in the private sector and slow it down a little bit. Uh, and, and whilst I, th I think there is a, a, a pretty good reason for it in terms of securing jobs and um, making these projects nice and full of, of cash and equity, but I don't think it helps with people like ourselves who, Baha, I think you did some Six Sigma and you've done some lean, lean management. When you do things like this, it is, mm -hmm. it is very uh, frustrating, as I say, to, to make things better. And uh, great to hear that Dale put in some Power BI and that's lovely to hear. Well done, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dale. Thank you. My oh, question is... Uh, oh, well, Dale was a, a trailblazer. He was a trailblazer, you know, keep, keeping up he? with Dale. Was, he was because... He came in and he started talking about a lang. In fact, we are using Power BI quite a lot. He he made a big, significant shift uh, in terms of how how we see ourselves. You know, mm. I mean, Dell and I went and did a presentation on the use of Power BI because we were doing all these reports till cows come home. You know, it's like, you know, we were doing how many reports, Dell, to how many people doing the same report, yeah. and um. And, and really, yeah, and actually he made a big, big uh, change in TFI. He doesn't maybe know it, but Power BI has become a bit of a cornerstone of what we do. Mm. Um, so thanks to Dale. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you were I'm right, yeah, yeah, no, I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, he never did anything like that. He wasn't definitely wasn't a trailblazer with us, Martin, was he? So I don't know what happened. He must have uh, switched gears <laughs> when he went changed. To... <laughs> I don't recognize it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Love <laughs> nah, you too. That's all right. We, uh, we love you, Dale. So, look, I, I think the other thing was you said something around um, you know, visibility and transparency about pu public opinion. Do, do you think um, if we had a visible workflow that people could see projects and how they operate? Because I don't think, as you said, a lot of people appreciate how complex or at least complicated or both uh, Crossrail is. And, you know, we always have politicians deciding launch dates or day one operation dates and they commit the, these dates and those dates are unmovable but arguably projects don't work like that 
So it would be better to maybe present projects to the public in a different way. Do you think there's some innovation we could do around that space? I think so. I think, you know, um, giving a window, which, which is something I think Mark Wilde did, it, it's very clever because when you're dealing with something so big, how can you give exact date? It's not possible because there's just so many facets and so much going on. How can you give exact date of something, you know? And mm. um, so it's, yeah, absolutely. You're totally um, spot on on that. You know, the politics seem to drive everything um, because, you know, the, um, in fact, I think politics doesn't really help uh, projects at all. Um, and in fact, uh, cause a lot of problem. Um, I think, um, you know, it's very important to stay real to the uh, reason for the project and what you're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, totally. I think um, it's important to give a window and something that you, you say, okay, this is what I'm doing. Like, you know, in the program, we have time risk allowance, yeah? You have planned mm -hmm. date, you have contractual date, you know, and it makes sense a project, a program so big, so complex should have something along those lines, you know, say between such and such, between this date and that date uh, to, to manage expectation, you know, as well. Because you have to, a perception is very powerful, but perception is not reality. Perception becomes reality. People make comments, they perceive something, and then they think it's real. But it's not necessarily the case. Uh, mm. So um, I think, you know, if you talk uh, negativity about something for a very long time, people believe it. People actually think that's what it is. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think the messaging uh, is very important. Um, and I'm a very, Dale knows, I'm a very open, honest, straightforward person. I probably never be a politician ever or have any sort of political <laughs> anything. But I think, you know, yeah, yeah. you have to really ma manage expectation. That's what they should do. Yeah. No, wise words, Baha. And as a thought experiment, because I know none of us are going to run for politics or anything. Uh, so, or maybe Dale will, I don't know. Um, I had a question or at least an idea, you know, what is, what does the future of governance look like? So if you had a blank canvas Baha and we said, right, let's scrap the books of the past. Let's start fresh. How would we go about creating a governance? Maybe it's a flexible system, as you said, based on the type of projects, because we did say they're all different yeah. and it does depend, but what would, what would be the best way to approach that problem? So I think, um, you have to look at the project and, you know, you don't go sledge, uh, not with a hammer, you know, with the sledgehammer, do you? You know, it's just the, the governance has to fit for the project. So you have to um, be flexible around how much of something you... So if you look at the project and think actually it's a very low value, but health and safety is quite, you know, you know the risk is high. So you put more emphasis on the health and safety aspect of that piece of work and then you do less of, let's say, um, you know, maybe the financial, maybe the um, project control. Now, I'm not saying don't have it, but you have less of it. So you concentrate mm -hmm. on the element that you believe the project needs more emphasis on. So you might have a project that um, is very, very, very high value and very precise, but then the, the health and safety aspect may not be as stringent. You know, there's nothing wrong to say, well, actually, um, maybe we more concentrate, have more um, energy spend on this element than the other. So it's, it's really, you have to keep assessing it as you move around. So then you say, okay, these type of project, this is how we're going to work with it, we, we visit, revisiting it, we visit it. Does it work? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? And then you come away from it and then, you know, so it's, it's, you should, con it's, it should be a live thing. 
It shouldn't be, this is how we do it. This is always we do it. This is how you have to do it. And you've conformed to this. And if you don't, you're not doing it. Yeah. Mm. So I think it should be like a live thing where you fit your, so it's a difficult uh, question for me to answer because depending, um, it, it's all dependent, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to this either, but I'm just, you know, hypothesizing what we could do about it and how we can improve it. There are some channels that you know us are definitely going to be on all projects like the approval process. And that might have several levels, you know, safety and, and assurance is going to be up there. You know, quality is going to be up there from a cert, from a client perspective. So you could probably name five or six different areas that you could at least isolate from a heavy governance perspective and then maybe treat everything else with a little, a little bit lighter um, payload. Mm -hmm. But it does make sense to have some form of governance. I think we're not saying throw it out. We're saying apply the right level because otherwise you frustrate mm -hmm. everyone on the project and you end up approving POs for two pound, which is fantastic. <laughs> but <laughs> look, that's all the questions I have. I'm going to pass over to Dale now. Thanks, Val. I, yeah, I had some thoughts around what you were saying there, Baha. So, so lessons learned, or as we like to say, lessons shared. How do we get, how do we get better at that? We should hook you up with Martin Paver and the data trusts. If you've got all these list lessons learned stored in <laughs> somewhere for, for, you know, Crossrail, then we put that into a data mm -hmm. trust with Mr. Paver, anonymize all of the data, and then HS2 and everyone else in Crossrail 2 and, and any other rail entity can actually pick out the lessons learned from there. So let's see if we can make that happen, you know. Um, the other thing that got me thinking around less is more sometimes around, you know, PMO and project controls, reminded me of our dear friend, Mr. Marco Frisendo, who said, actually, we can, we can actually have fewer PMO people if project managers were better. Um, so there's a bit of uh, provocation there. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the, the, the image that I'm, or, or analogy, and Martin and, and Val, now I love the analogies that I'm stuck on with, with um, governance is, guide rails on a bowling alley, right? And it, it's just trying to keep you from going into the gutter, really. That's what it should be doing for me, governance. It shouldn't be stopping the ball from hitting the pins necessarily. It should just should be allowing you to stay in that lane to hit the target um, and not go, go off track. Um, but yeah, I wonder if you had any comebacks to anything I threw at you there, Farha. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a very good analogy. I think you're right, you know, and, uh, you know, it's good to have it. It's just, you know, how wide are the gutters, you know, and uh, how big is the ball, you know? Mm. <laughs> so but there's all kids? these variables, you know? <laughs> Guardrails so, are know, for kids, all... though, aren't they, Dale? They are, they are. Yeah. But, I mean, you get some people that are grown-ups that have never bowled, so they need them to, mm. right? And that's, that's perhaps people coming that's into the true. profession. I know these people. It's <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's but, amused. <laughs> Martin, Martin's never amused with us, uh, so that's nothing new, Baha. But look, hey, look, yeah, we've got to make some space for our features. Mm. Um, and this is a, probably a surprise for you, Baha, because uh, you've not been on the podcast before. So for this, we're going to hand back to Machine Gun Martin um, to take you through your paces. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, we have a feature at the end of the show called uh, Defend the Indefensible. So it's where we ask our guests to defend a ridiculous statement for 30 seconds. And it's inspired by some of the, the wonderful things we've come across in the course of our careers. So if you're willing to give it a go. Um, oh God! We can. <laughs> make that was a, a bit of a curveball. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, so Baha, you have thirty seconds to defend the following statement: Every project should have to go to a governance committee for any spend over five pound. Discuss. <laughs> oh, absolutely! You have to do it because without that, you know, somebody's going to ask, "How did you spend the money? Why did you spend the five pounds?" What did you spend it on? So yeah, definitely. We, and we should have as many people as possible sitting around the table. The more the merrier. So they ask the question for every pound of that five pound that you're planning to spend. Oh, of course, you know, it's necessary. You know, without it, we're all going to fall apart. You know, we're going to all go bankrupt. 
So yeah, we need to have one. <laughs> What's that 30 seconds? Thanks a lot. That's very good. <laughs> well done. I really hope someone from the National Audit Office is listening now. Um, before you go, um, we've got time for one more feature. It's called Fiverr. So it's five quick fire questions all about yourself. And if you're ready, let's give it a go. Uh, question one, steak, seafood or salad? Seafood. What are the three must-have behaviors you look for in successful project teams? Empathy and care. What's the one piece of advice for people new to the project profession? Be patient and care for your people. What would be your book recommendation to our listeners? Oh, How to turn the ship around. <laughs> nice. Who's that by? Marquez. David Marquez. Very good. If you had your time again, would you choose to have an engineering degree or would you choose to go into project management or project controls? <laughs> engineering degree all day long. Engineering all day long. Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you so much for finally agreeing to come on the pod and sharing your views and insight. Um, you know, it, it's always great to hear people's stories and, you know, where they've come from and the struggles they, they, they have with, you know, the way things are set up and, and what sort of inhibits us sometimes for, for, from delivering projects the way we, we think they should be. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, but before we let you go, are there any final thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with? Um, no, I think this is great. I'm really, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I, and it's a great experience, you know, and I, you know, I, it's, it's nice. It's nice to be able to open up and actually it's like a download, isn't it? So I'm going to feel really good after this. <laughs> Sleep well. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, so thanks for that. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, my, my takeaway from this is that, um, yeah, you, you just have to try and keep pushing, keep trying, keep trying, keep persevering, never give up. You know, I think for me, um, being, uh, you know, persistent, you know, you know, keep trying and, and supporting people around you will sub they support you. You know, I, this, it's been really brilliant for me. I, I wouldn't change maybe I change a few things, but, <laughs> you know, but uh, I think what, what struggles and hardness make, make you better in many, many ways, you know, sometimes maybe a bit too difficult, but, you know, I, I think, um, I wouldn't change any, any aspect of my, my career in a sense. Uh, it, it made me a better person. Um, and I met a lot of fantastic people along the way. Um, so yeah, I think I really, I really encourage people to come to any form of type of um, aspect of project, project control, project management, engineer. They're all needed. We all need it. So yeah, it's. Um, I think that's that's for me. And you know, I hope people enjoy this talk and. Um, I hope I wasn't too controversial. <laughs> I don't think you were controversial enough, Baha. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the you know rest of the journey. You know, it's the, the journey, not not the end. I think the journey that matters. And yeah, who knows? Maybe we, there is a book or two somewhere. <laughs> well, we'll At wait some stage. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait to get you back for the book release. There we go. Bar, yes, Sadie, yes. Thank you so much, Val. Thank any you. final thoughts from you? No, look, thanks for your time. And I hopefully had a lot of uh, enjoyment and therapy from this session. I mean, we get a lot out of it as well. So we appreciate your perspectives on governance and uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Martha. Have a good evening. <laughs> Bye, there. Speak soon. Thanks, Baha. Folks, there Bye. you've heard it. That's Bye. all the time we have. <laughs> Remember, you can also help us pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your favorite social media. Once again, a massive, massive thank you to Baha Maxody and thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me, Val, and Martin, it's bye for now. Mm -hmm.